Good morning, everybody. Uh, here, I welcome you to our uh, series of webinars, this time about uh, the, our, the release of our last uh, issue of the Pages Magazine about Palo earthquakes and tsunamis. I'm uh, very happy here to, to welcome three of our, um, uh, our authors in the, in the last issue and one of our guest editors, our authors who volunteer to provide some insights about the articles that they contributed with to these uh, special issues are Bell Filibosian, Jamie Howard, and Siddharth uh, Pritzombala. Our guest editor, Renaldo Gastono, also joined the, the webinar and perhaps we'll have time to, to discuss about the futures, perspectives, and challenges of the paleoseismology field. So we will start now the webinar. I will introduce our speakers and then uh, after their presentations, we'll have a few minutes to have a, a, a short discussion about, about the future or our and challenges of the paleoseismology field. We will start our first speaker will be Belle uh, Fili Filibosian. She finished her bachelor at California Institute of uh, Technology, Caltech in 2005, and her PhD in the same university in 2013. Since then, she's employed at the research, uh, uh, as a research geologist at the US uh, Geological Survey Earthquake Science Center and works on paleoseismology and earthquake geology. Our second speaker will be Siddharth uh, Pritzombala. He studied at the Maharaja Sajajirao University of Baroda, India. Did I say it correctly, Siddharth? Yes. Yes. In 2006, he finished his uh, PhD at the same university in 2013. He's uh, currently employed at the University of uh, Seismological Research at uh, Gandhinagar in India. His works is on pursuing uh, paleotsunami studies along the west coast of India, spanning the Holocene, human resilience to natural disasters during the last 5,000 years in Western India, and active uh, tectonic studies in Himalayas and Gujarat. Holocene, during the Holocene. Our final speakers will be Jamie Howard. He got his uh, Bachelor in Physical Geography and Ecology in 2006 and his PhD in Physical Geography in 2012 at the University of Otago in New Zealand. He's currently Associate Professor and Deputy Head of a School at the School of Geography and Environmental and Earth Sciences in Victoria University of Wellington. He uses marine and lacustrine sedimentary records to reconstruct the earthquake behavior of plate boundaries and how these events drive erosion, landscape evolution, and the carbon cycling. So now, uh, Belle will start with her presentation. You can share your screen, and the floor is uh, yours. Thank you. To all the attendees, please uh, mute your microphones and wait for the discussion, open discussion, and the end of all the talks. Sorry, just give me a minute here to get the screen share going. No problem. Okay, do you see the slide correctly? Great. Okay, so um, I'll start by giving a little overview of the coral microatoll method, which is the topic of the article that I submitted to the Pages magazine. So this is a, a, a method that I guess I'm one of the few experts in in the world. It's kind of an unusual method. So I'll uh, give a little background and some of the um, pros and cons and some of the um, great successes that uh, we've had with this technique. So let's see if I can play this. So the method that we're using is taking advantage of the fact that if we have um, a fault 
under the water. Typically, this is a subduction zone, but it could work for other types of vaults um, that is slowly sinking as the subducting plate is going down. And then when an earthquake happens, it elastically, uh, the ground pops up again. So um, I'll play that one more time. So if we have corals that are growing on the shores of this little island here with the palm tree, um, during the interseismic period, they're gradually sinking down into the water. And then when an earthquake happens, they suddenly pop up out of the water. And what we discover when uh, this happens is, now if I can figure out how to go to the next slide, there we go. So um, this is an example of uh, the uplift and subsidence that happened during a particular earthquake in Indonesia in 2005. All of these yellow areas were uplifted in some places up to two meters and uh, the blue areas subsided uh, up to a meter. So this has a major impact on the coastlines um, in general, but in particular on uh, corals that are growing in these waters. So if we look at an area in this yellow area um, where the reef was uplifted, you can see the entire reef is now out of the water. All of the corals have died. And um, whereas if we look at an area in the blue zone, which subsided, we have a ghost forest where all of the trees were killed due to subsidence into the seawater. So uh, ghost forests are another technique, which I'm not going to talk about for um, doing paleoseismology, but we're going to talk about the corals. So microatolls are a particular form of corals, um, a, a form that corals take if they are growing in the intertidal zone. So all of these are different species of corals that form microatolls. What you can see is basically the top of the, the top surface is dead because it is its growth is limited by relative sea level. So if these then suddenly are lifted up out of the water during an earthquake, they will die um, additionally, uh, perhaps completely. So we can use these to determine um, the very precise timing and, and amounts of uplift or subsidence that happened in past earthquakes because they're responding to that relative sea level. So these are just some pictures showing how the microatoll um, method, uh, how the sampling proceeds. So we survey the elevations of these corals very precisely. Uh, that can be a challenge if they're completely underwater. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks. And then we can take a slice of these corals here using a hydraulic chainsaw to get at the history of growth over time. We cannot even do this if they're completely submerged using scuba gear. So here's what one of these coral slices look like. And you can see here that there are these uh, beautiful annual bands, which are growing similar to tree rings. And that is what gives us this incredible temporal precision of this technique. So this is now an X-ray of one of these slices. So that really brings out the annual band so we can count them very precisely. And we can also collect samples for um, uranium thorium dating. So ultimately, here's um, another schematic of one of these slices. And um, you can see early in its life, it was growing upward, upward, upward every year. And then suddenly it almost completely died due to an uplift and an earthquake. And then that process repeated again. So we can chart out the height of this coral in every year, and that gives us the rate of inner seismic subsidence, the amount of uplift in an earthquake, and then um, those values again for a second uh, event. So by putting all of, um, by, by sampling corals all over Sumatra, which is the place that this method has been applied most successfully, we have constructed this record of um, earthquakes over 700 years. So it's remarkably precise for um, having the significant prehistoric period. We've identified a number of really interesting um, and perhaps hitherto underappreciated uh, 
fault behaviors with this technique. One of these is persistent barriers to rupture. We, we despite um, having this long record, we never see any earthquakes that rupture through these particular points. Uh, so we think it's likely that the that very rarely or perhaps never happens. We're also able to identify um, when similar ruptures have occurred in the past and also rupture cascades. So in this particular area, we have these uh, series of events that um, each of which is unique, but they occur in these clusters rupturing the, the entire uh, section of fault. We can also see what I've termed a superimposed cycle where there's this different type of event. This is a very shallow tsunami earthquake, which is occurring um, less frequently perhaps every thousand years, whereas these uh, more typical subduction events are occurring more like every 200 years. We also can compare the uh, modern, very tight cascade of events that's occurred since uh, 2000 um, and question whether that might have occurred, something similar might have occurred in the past. This one is not nearly as tight. It's maybe um, over a hundred years or so, but in that same relatively short period of time, the entire plate interface in this area has ruptured. And we wouldn't be able to really say for sure whether any of these things had happened if we didn't have this very precise uh, coral data. So, and, and looking in a little bit more detail, even at this group of events, we're able to actually model what each of the slip in these events looks like on the plate interface. And these are all prehistoric events. So this is uh, typically something that you would only be able to do with instrumental data. Um, all, we have also illuminated inner seismic effects such as changes in fault coupling, either co-seismic or not, and also long-term slow slip events, all from these um, data in Sumatra. So um, to summarize, this very high temporal precision allows events only a few years apart to be distinguished from each other. And that is what enables us to um, see fault behavior in more detail than we can with just about any other uh, paleoseismic technique. This centimeter scale precision of the uplift and subsidence allows us to actually model fault slip uh, again, in a way that would typically be limited to the instrumental era. And another advantage of this technique is that the there's a relatively low marginal cost once you have all the specialized equipment to sample many sites in an area. Um, disadvantage, of, of course, the biggest one is that it's limited to where corals exist, so the natural distribution of microatolls. It's not sensitive to strike-slip fault motion, so you have to have a dip-slip fault in order to uh, use this technique. And these measurements may be confounded by sea level changes uh, that are non-tectonic, so that's something that we have to account for and remove from our data. So, um, to summarize, um, I believe this technique may be a useful component for any study that's involving tectonic uplift or subsidence along coastlines where corals grow. And I encourage everyone to think about it if you're working in such an area. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Belle. Thank you so much for these insights about corals and their potential in paleoseismology. Our next speaker will be Siddharth uh, Pritzombala. So you can start sharing your screen, Siddharth, yes. and, and introducing your uh, contribution to the Pages magazine. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK. I don't know how to maximize, but OK, I go ahead with this. On the lower bottom, yeah. there is a option to maximize. Okay. Yeah, there. This is good. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I'll be talking about the characterization of paleo tsunami deposits along the west coast of India. And I'll start with see mostly when we talk of uh, paleo tsunami deposits, there is something what we call the extreme wave events. That is basically the combination of storms and tsunamis both. Because it is not always pretty easy or pretty straightforward to differentiate between a storm deposit and a tsunami deposit in a paleo sedimentary record, right? Uh, when we talk in terms of dynamics, tsunami is 
basically a large wave which is created because of disturbance in the uh, in the sea uh, sea water column mostly because of a submarine earthquake or a submarine landslide volcanic eruption or a meteorite impact compared to that storm is basically a atmospheric disturbance which basically because of the strong winds pushes the top column of sea uh, with high speed so which leads to high storm surge high waves on the shoreline of the sea hello okay so compared to both both are basically leading to a large wave which impacts the shoreline and creates a lot a lot of destruction the main objective for us is to understand the uh, origin of the wave is it tsunami or a storm so basically talk about because tsunamis are much more destructive than storms and in paleo records the signatures are slightly overlapping so we need a very good understanding of the local configuration the wave dynamics the characteristics of sedimentary record why should we doing that is because a chunk of our population cluster of our population is residing along the shorelines the most active infrastructure development right now in any part of at least in part of the western india is going on along the shorelines there are deep sea ports and different types of connectivity that are, that are being created over there uh, developed over there so it is very important for us to assess the hazard of that now when we talk of tsunami and storms there are three things which are to be addressed number one is the distinguishing criteria between a storm and a tsunami deposit in a sedimentary record number 2 is the recurrence rate of tsunami genic events along a particular source along a particular fault which is creating that causative fault and the third thing is to assess the coastal vulnerability zones which are which would actually be impacted in near future scenarios where we can be really be prepared and we can talk about mitigation here you can see the uh, north Uh, northern arabian sea you can see the three major sources that we have here the makran subduction zone in the north is actually the major culprit the major one major uh, tsunami genic source in the region the southern ovan ridge is basically a slightly fault but some of the submarine landslides over there that have been recorded have led to small tsunamis along the shoreline of india as well and then you have the kalsberg ridge in the south which again is a slightly uh, slightly by nature in the right side of your screen you can see the coastal configuration of gujarat region of western india we have all sorts of coastal configurations we have a open coast which is beach uh, beach ridge dune kind of configuration then we have gulfs which have wide monotonous mud flats wide uh, landforms gradient based landforms and then part of the shoreline also is of rocky shoreline which is basically limestone uh, made up of limestone and it is basically a short platform abutting against the coastal dunes so why am i uh, discussing this coastal configuration is because when you talk of paleo tsunami deposits when you want to go and hunt for a paleo tsunami deposit create a archive of it you need to understand how does the coast respond or different geomorphic landforms respond in event of a tsunami or a storm basically in the event of an extreme event uh a uh, segment of a coastline which has a barrier like configuration like suppose it has beach ridges or dunes and you have wave abutting against it breaches it deposits something behind your dunes and then the water recedes off you'll still have some probability of some amount of material that was eroded from the offshore being deposited on the landward side and being archived the second thing scenario would be your wide mud flats which would be the gulf kind of configuration where it is basically gradient lest very wide monotonous landform but it doesn't have any barrier like configuration which would actually abut or stop your uh, offshore sediments that were driven because of tsunami and uh, like preserving them on the shoreline see when you talk about when when we actually talk about paleo tsunami deposits and try and understand them and try and evaluate them the thing is a tsunami would have hit your entire shoreline but there would be only pockets sheltered environments where it would be preserved for you to see that in near future like if something happens right now all along the shoreline of let's say kutch in gujarat in western india then your entire kutch coast will experience the tsunami but the deposits will only be pocketed and preserved in some parts let's say after a thousand years somebody comes to study it they'll only be able to pick those pockets if they target it over there then only they'll they are going to find the evidences of it because the rest of it is going to be washed off again by the receding wave of the tsunami or a storm same is the case with your rocky shoreline which we don't discuss in detail here but it also have a similar source where rocks or huge boulders are thrown on the landward side supra tidal zone so basically 
offshore material in a tsunami or a storm scenario is basically eroded from the subtidal or the uh, deep sea region to more supratidal region which you basically characterize so this is an example of kutch coast where we show 3 to 4 sites where we took shallow cores along the shoreline and we could pick sand layer which was sandwiched between your mud layers had a thickness of mostly 20 to 30 cm roughly varying at different places the sedimentological character showed that the sand layer was assorted in nature lagged sorting it had more more of a coarse grain with a lot of broken shell fragments in it interestingly it had mud balls or rip up clast in the in, in that assorted sand layer which is a very good and strong indicator that a very strong wave which had a lot of energy eroded the substrate in the uh, of your region from the highest of high water line approximately to a distance of 250 meters we we did at every place you find such kind of a deposit we take transects across the coast and with multiple trenches we find that the maximum distance till where we can where we could map the sand sheet was up to a distance of 250 meters from the high water line and when you put the grain size of it and the sedimentology of it it showed a resemble a physical character of a sand sheet like deposition roughly along a, an enigmatic length of 250 kilometers of kutch uh, 200 kilometers of kutch coast and basically the grain size was slightly reducing when you go towards landward side and the sand layer got tapered at the surface when you go moved much more landward side for, uh, in all these locations so this were very good sedimentological signatures which pointed us that it was most likely a extreme event and most likely because of this magnitude it resembled that of a tsunami we dated that using ams radiocarbon dating and osl dating both at the same time for multiple trenches and the age was somewhere around 1000 years old we could pinpoint it to 1008 ad tsunami based on archaeological evidences and literature in the arabian sea that there was an earthquake in strait of hormuz in 1008 ad which also affected some of the ships that were harbored at the iranian shoreline the same thing was observed in the indian part as well and in the iranian regions as well this was uh geochem uh, we used geochemistry in this particular study to talk about the provenance because what we have in the kutch coast is mostly deccan trapped uh, derived source where the deccan trapped derived sands uh, rich sands are there in the offshore and they are eroded and thrown back on the landward side so that's what we see in the provenance changes as well in the geochemical parameters uh but at the same time in another study which where we which we did on the tip of the western region this was along earlier was along the north coast of gulf of kutch and now it we are along the south coast of gulf of kutch you can see the study area on the uh, right bottom part of the slide this was again a sheltered environment where we found the evidences of 1945 tsunami that happened along this region again the source was makaran subduction zone the one of the most important things that would help you in distinguishing a paleo tsunami deposit is also the biota the foraminifers the diversity of foraminifers abruptly changes along the tsunami sand layer and it has very less diversity and above and below environments which were slightly shallow marine to intertidal in nature even the broken shell fragments the characteristic changes the sedimentological nature again resembled that of the kutch what we uh, is, uh, saw over there presence of mud balls rip up clast uh, assorted nature of sand you can see in the uh, photo over here in the figure as well and this had a landward extent of more than 570 meters from the high water Line, highest of high water line now when people talk about the landward extent of any sand layer and we say that in tsunami you have for kilometers you get the uh, deposits inside even the some sand some of, some of the storms also push them inside it is very important to understand what was the nature what is the nature of typical storms in the arabian sea every region has different storm or cyclone or typhoon and this hurricane categories and in the intensity and strength varies from geographical regions in arabian sea we only had one super cyclone that was gunu which is the only recorded super cyclone in the history of arabian sea and even that did not have this much of inland extent so getting this inland extent compared to that gave us strong criteria and because of that uh, what the, the, the geological studies that we did along this region we could identify seven extreme wave events where this two were categorically we strongly believe they are tsunami deposits other are paleo storm one or two are paleo storm deposits and some are extreme wave events and we also found one boulder deposit which we feel is a paleo tsunami deposit which was it was characteristically very high compared to the uh, strength of storms that we have in this region but when we talk of this catalog it is still in the making we still have less data to see point data is not enough to talk about anything when you want to talk about recurrence rate as i told you which is one of the burning points that anybody would ask you, uh, anybody would anticipate so then in this northern part of arabian sea 
we have the 1945 makran tsunami that we recorded here it's also recorded in sur, uh, sur lagoon in oman then we have 1008 ad in state of hormuz earthquake which was a uh, tsunami that was recorded in by us in the kutch coast by uh, a group in the iran and shah hosni at all in iran as well at the same time you had some archaeological artifacts uh, literature from the pakistan region where they talked about the 326 bc event of alexander fleet which was which experienced it and then you had one tsunami which was recorded 4000 years ago from oman by hoffman et al and group roughly in a very first hand way you see a large interval of 1000 years of a tsunami generated by the makran subduction zone which affects all the nations in the vicinity the oman iran pakistan and india so in line of this now we are also trying to get into the tsunami genic signatures of iran because it's exactly sitting in front of the makran subduction zone so this is just a glimpse of claim that you were that we did at the iranian shoreline and we are trying to evaluate if, if some of this is tsunami or it is all the storm in that region particularly and coming at this i would say that the main challenges and future perspectives if we see in terms of tsunami research characterization in india and in worldwide also is that first of all there is a lot of debate about the distinction between a tsunami and a storm deposit if we want to really want to talk about the distinction at least in any particular region we need to have a very good strong data set of paleo storms as i said in arabian sea we only have 2007 goru which was recorded instrumentally we don't have much paleo temporological research paleo from research in the indian context at least which we are now trying to do so once you understand what is a maximum storm or a super cyclone or let's say a very severe cyclone could deposit in your uh, region could impact in your region then you can push that boundary of your paleo deposit being a tsunami or a storm arguing it on that basis so that is very important that needs to be done in this region and of course you have to study that with a multi proxy analysis which series of studies we understood that you need to integrate sedimentology geochemistry grain size analysis foraminiferal uh, inputs in this different criteria so that would make the story make the understanding very strong and give you a very good story about how was the uh, hazard implications in terms of tsunami and storm in that in, in your region as and when we talk of recurrence the main problem is we need to have more older record we only have two and we have as i showed you in our catalog we have only gone as early as 5000 years ago we couldn't go beyond that because the sea level in our region was at a peak at 5000 years and before that between 10000 to 5000 it was receded but uh, the sea level was below the present day level hence we anticipate that the signatures of the hazard that took place at that time might be in this subtidal region right now that we haven't seen till date so that that is what something we need to look into uh, into now and it is very important for us to map the vulnerability of the shorelines when you when we want to actually map the vulnerability the most important thing comes is the islands and island nations that we have in this region we have quite a few island nations and island in the arabian sea in the northern indian ocean region the hazard to this places is much more higher than to countries like let's say india iran pakistan because they are completely surrounded by the oceanic regime and a catastrophic tsunami could lead to devastation in this kind of region so that needs to be looked into also the evaluation of risk assessment of the different segments of the region especially places like gulf like in india in gujarat where i studied we have the gulf of kutch and the gulf of khambat which has the tidal amplification of more than 11 meters so in that context if we try to understand let's say a tsunami would have happened during the high tide region the the effect of the tsunami would have been disastrous in this region and we need to assess the risk assessment based on those worst case scenarios and not just the open shoreline of our region that we have in uh, that we have in gujarat and this part of the world so this is all that i would like to put in thank you abar thank you sidar a lot of uh, food for thought uh, combination of proxies very interesting yes. combination of microfossil sedimentological yeah. and chemical proxies and a lot of open questions discrimination yeah. reoccurrence vulnerability very interesting very very nice and general overview thank you thank so you. our last speaker will be Jamie the floor is yours Jamie how are you Fantastic. Thank you very much. Can you guys uh, see the slideshow? Yes. Fantastic. 
Right. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about um, turbidite paleoseismology, which is an approach that used turbidites to reconstruct the magnitude and frequency of earthquakes, largely at subduction zones. Um, and I'm going to do that through the lens of the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake, which was one of the best instrumented earthquakes um, globally and allowed us to actually interrogate how turbidites actually record the ground motions produced by this earthquake and indeed information about the fault source, and in doing so, test some of the assumptions of this turbidite paleoseismology approach. So, what is turbidite paleoseismology? Well, at subduction zones where the faults that we're interested in are offshore, we have to rely on off-fault paleoseismic records. Bella, Bell gave a fab fabulous example of using coastal deformation to reconstruct earthquake magnitude and frequency of subduction zones. The other way that we can get at this problem is looking at damage generated by the ground motions produced by the earthquake. And indeed, uh, it's in that category that turbidite paleoseismology lies. So the concept is that you have strong ground motions produced by rupture on a subduction fault, and this destabilizes um, unconsolidated sediments and canyons, canyon heads. Then, then evolve down the canyons as um, turbidity currents depositing uh, turbidites um, in the sedimentary record at the canyon outlets. And the concept being that you have damaging ground motions over large areas, uh, resulting in this process of turbidity current triggering and turbidite emplacement occurring synchronously along large tracks um, of uh, a margin. Now, this approach has been used in subduction zones around the world to produce arguably some of the longest and most complete paleoseismic records. The um, poster child for this, I guess, is the Cascadia subduction zone, where we have canyons along a thousand kilometres um, of the subduction zone. And Chris Goldfinger's work um, going back 20 years uh, basically made arguments based on synchronously triggered turbidites um, along this margin uh, to reconstruct the spatial and temporal pattern of rupture. And here's an example of um, the spatial distribution of turbidites inferred to be triggered by the last rupture of the Cascadia subduction zone in uh, 1700, um, showing um, a margin-wide event. Now, implicit in this approach is this assumption that A, we can use the stratigraphic record to actually identify synchronous turbidity currents um, and placing turbidites um, along a margin, and that there is some relationship, direct relationship between the spatial distribution of those um, in-place turbidites, the ground motions produced by the earthquake, and indeed the fault source. That's implicit in this reconstruction that you see here. The problem is uh, we don't have any good, well-instrumented earthquakes where we can actually test any of these assumptions. And as a result, there's been a decades long debate in the literature about whether turbidite paleoseismology has sufficient veracity to produce reliable earthquake records that could provide really important insights into the dynamics of subduction zone earthquake behavior, but also uh, for hazard um, at subduction zones. Enter the Kaikoura earthquake, which us provides us with exactly this testbed to evaluate some of the assumptions that underpin turbidite paleoseismology. So this earthquake occurred in the, uh, the southern end of the Hikarangi subduction margin, where um, the Pacific plate is subducting beneath the Australian plate um, in northern New Zealand. It ruptured um, a series of crustal faults and indeed the subduction interface underlying them in a magnitude 7.8 earthquake. Um, the fault sources are really well resolved um, by INSAR fault mapping and seismology. Um, and we have a distribution of um, strong ground motion sensors um, along the islands that actually allow really well calibrated ground motion models. Um, and here's an example of one here. So we have detailed information on the fault source. We have really good constraint on what the ground motions were um, spatially for this earthquake. And we actually have um, an ideally oriented um, sedimentary dispersal system for testing turbidite paleoseismology because we have canyons incising um, the continental shelf, shelf that are oriented both perpendicular and parallel to um, the strike of the earthquake and the ground motions that it produced. So um, this work occurred through a series of projects and the first um, was uh, in 2016, we're actually at sea 
when this earthquake happened. And we were able to use a combination of um, coring uh, along the margin and um, multi-beam differencing to establish the fact that um, the Kaikoura earthquake did indeed trigger a turbidity current. Um, and we were able to uh, make that link between the earthquake and the turbidites in place using uh, radiometric dating, um, indeed targeting the radioisotope thorium-234, which has a really short half-life of about 24 days. So if you find this in the turbidite sediments, you can make a really clear link between the emplacement, recent emplacement of this bed and the occurrence of an earthquake, which is what we did. Um, and that allowed us to develop a set of criteria um, that we've used in subsequent quarant campaigns to identify the Kaikoura event bed. And that is a lack of bioturbation, um, the preservation of this oxic layer, which is the pre-event sea floor preserved underneath the turbidite, and indeed the presence of um, fresh biological remains in the turbidite sediments. So taking this approach, we then basically cored uh, 20 discrete sedimentary dispersal systems or canyons along 700 kilometers of the margin um, using about 100 sediment cores to build up a picture of where the Kaikoura turbidite was in place and where it wasn't. And that allows us to interrogate the relationship between fault source ground motions and where turbidites are in place, one of the fundamental assumptions that goes into turbidite paleoseismology. So what you see here in, in these white polygons with the red dots, this is where we have the Kaikoura um, earthquake in placing uh, a turbidite, and the black um, polygons are discrete canyon systems where they didn't. What we see from this picture, oh, and in the background here, sorry, we have the spatial distributions of strong ground motions uh, from the earthquake measured in peak ground velocity, with the more yellow colors being the higher uh, peak ground velocities. What we see here is that we have ubiquitous triggering of turbidity currents from this earthquake in consecutive discrete canyons along some 200 kilometers of the margin. That's great, it shows that earthquakes do produce these spatially contiguous triggering patterns and emplacement patterns. There is also a really nice relationship between the spatial distribution of strong ground motions and this pattern of turbidite emplacement. And in fact, there's a relatively narrow band of peak uh, ground velocities between 17 and 24 centimeters a second uh, where we see triggering uh, occurring. Below that, um, they don't occur. So this demonstrates very nicely that there's a close relationship between the spatial distribution of strong ground motions and the emplacement of turbidites. However, uh, when we go back to that fundamental assumption, um, when we are inverting the spatial distribution of turbidites for the fault source, there is a bit of a problem here in that we see we've got triggering of turbidites up to 100 kilometers north of where the rupture actually occurred in this instance. And so that means that we, going forward, need a much more nuanced approach for actually inverting the spatial distribution of turbidites for um, the specific fault source on which they occur. And we really encourage um, the approach that we've used here, using these physics-based ground motion models to kind of explore what range of potential sources and rupture directions um, on the faults that rupture could actually generate um, the spatial distribution of turbidites. So, the good news of this is that some of the fundamental assumptions of turbidite paleoseismology play out um, with this well-instrumented example. The question we have is, can you actually reconstruct synchronous distributions of turbidite emplacement from the sediment record? And this has been a really significant source of debate. So unlike Bell's fabulous example, when she can date her earthquakes down to a given year, when you're dealing with turbidites and uh, numerical dating techniques, the best you can probably do is get decadal or maybe even centennial um, level uncertainty on your event ages. And this means making arguments of synchronous triggering between consecutive distributary systems based on the numerical chronology alone is really problematic. So people have posited or hypothesized these synchronicity tests. The confluence test is one of them. It's been vigorously debated in Cascadia about whether it's appropriate, and we can actually test it in this Kaikoura example. So um, this hypothesis states that if you have two adjacent canyon systems that are joined downstream by a confluence, um, and you core uh, both above and downstream with a confluence, as you can see here, that if you have synchronous triggering, you should see the same number of turbidites both above and downstream of that confluence. 
implying that you've had synchronous triggering. The key thing here, of course, is you're counting between two temporal datums. However, if you have an additive number, so there's more turbidites downstream of the confluence than you have above between your two temporal datums, then it implies that the triggering between these two systems was asynchronous. Um, so it fails this confluence test. Now, there's been no systematic test of this for known earthquakes, and we can actually do this using a natural experiment for uh, the southern Hikarangi margin. We have the Kaikoura earthquake, which we've discussed, and we have the penultimate large earthquake here, which was an 1855 uh, rupture of the subduction interface and the wider upper fault um, of magnitude 8.2. So um, to test this confluence test, we focused in on a specific confluence here um, between the Hikarangi channel um, the Campbell Canyon, the Cook Strait Canyon, and the Upawahi Canyon here. Um, and all of these four canyons join at this confluence here um, and uh, this downstream site um, is the downstream example. Now, um, we have this really rich distribution of cores um, and where the Kaikoura event being is present or absent, and that speaks to um, the ideal locations for uh, selecting cores for turbidite paleoseismology, and you can have a look in the pages article um, for a brief synopsis of that. I won't address it here. Um, what we want to do then is we've gone through and we've dated the sequences um, using uh, lead to 10 and uh, plutonium, um, allowing us to date uh, the Kaikoura event bed and the penultimate event bed um, in these core sites. And what we see then is um, the conceptual confluence test mapped onto the specific example where we have sites A, B, C, and D um, above the confluence um, between these canyons and site E below. So here are these cores here. These are CT stacks um, that are showing the um, density tomography of the cores and the turbidites um, are mapped out very nicely. Uh, here is the Kaikoura event bed. Um, here's the penultimate turbidite and there's an extra turbidite in some of these cores. We can map out our temporal datums. Um, so we've got the sea floor in 2019, 1953, 1970, um, and, 19, uh, and 1750 from our chronology. And then we can count the number of turbidites that are occur between these temporal datums to assess the confluence test. So um, we have the 2016 earthquake, which produced one turbidite above and below the confluence. So that's a pass. Between 1950 and 1870, there's a, a turbidite downstream of the confluence um, and one in the Hikarangi channel here, um, but there's not in these other feeder canyons. And so this is an example where the confluence test fails. There wasn't synchronous triggering in these canyons. There was a flow that came down the Hikarangi channel. Um, the last example here, uh, we have one turbidite both above and below the confluence, and that dates to the 1855 Wairarapa earthquake. So here we have a really nice example of known earthquakes that test the confluence test in action. And we see that it actually provides a really useful tool for um, demonstrating synchronous triggering between canyon systems that are separated by tens to hundreds of kilometers. And um, we see that we only get synchronous triggering in this instance where we've had the known historic earthquake. So it provides some confidence that this is a useful methodology for demonstrating synchronous triggering along um, margins for the purposes of per turbidite paleoseismology. Um, the last synchronicity test that I'll talk about that we can test using this data set is this idea of turbidite fingerprinting. It's used widely in Cascadia to underpin that turbidite paleoseismic record and it's received significant criticism. And so the idea here is that the, st the FASI stacking pattern of turbidites relates, relates to velocity surges in the flows and that those velocity surges uh, relate to some property of um, properties of uh, triggering in the headwaters of the canyons that might be related to ground motions. And as a result of that, we expect to see the same stacking pattern or the number of velocity surges in the flow in discrete canyon systems along strike, providing essentially a barcode or a fingerprint that allows us to identify the same event and argue for synchronicity. Um, this, of course, is entirely untested. We, I tried to do this approach for uh, the known turbidites for the Kaikoura earthquake, and we see a couple of things fall out. Uh, we see very different fingerprints between the southern canyons, where there's a single grain size and velocity pulse, 
um, in these systems. Uh, and these northern canyons where this, this multiple uh, series of stacked um, grain size and um, hence uh, velocity surges in the flow. What's interesting is that this relates very nicely to, oh, to the uh, triggering threshold that we have um, for the earthquake when we compare the seismograms from um, the model ground motions. And indeed, we see that in these southern canyons, uh, the ground motion time history only exceeds the triggering threshold once um, in the time frame um, of, of the earthquake, but multiple times in these northern canyons, um, potentially providing a link between ground motions and the mechanisms that people have used to underpin this turbidite fingerprinting approach, that you have multiple phases of failure that result in multiple velocity surges in the flow and therefore multiple grain size pulses. The problem is, if we were to interpret this sedimentary signature, this fingerprint from the geological record, we would actually come up with two discrete earthquakes. And so real care needs to be taken when using this turbidite fingerprinting approach to actually argue for synchronous triggering along margins. So where has the Kaikoura earthquake got us in terms of dealing with some of this debate about um, the use of turbidite paleoseismic records and whether they're valuable? Uh, well, it provides a useful test through direct observations, and we've learned that there is a really predictable relationship between the spatial distribution of ground motions and turbidite emplacement, but we need to take much more quantitative approaches if we want to invert the spatial distribution of synchronously emplaced turbidites for some information about the fault source, and that is an area where we need to um, direct our attentions in future. Um, the confluence test remains a really effective tool for demonstrating synchronous triggering between discrete canyons along a margin when our dating is not sufficiently precise um, to do it alone. Um, but turbidite fingerprinting uh, is probably something that we need to be much more circumspect about using. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Very interesting talk highlighting the problems, difficulties of uh, determining the synchronicity between turbidite deposits is far more complex than anybody could have thought. Uh, but I think it's very interesting that you highlight this and and, and you make it uh, clear to the paleo community that all this uh, yeah, paleo seismology has, uh, depending on the sedimentary environment, has their own world, own difficulties. So we had a very nice overview from coastal deformation to dis uh, discrimination between uh, tsunamis uh, and storm deposits, and now the, the problem with the determining synchronicity between regional uh, turbidite deposits. And now I would like to, well, first uh, give the opportunity, well, th first thank again all the all the speakers and give the opportunity if the audience uh, has, uh, anyone in the audience has any questions for the speakers or in general for all, all the people attending. If not, I will have a few questions for all of you to start the discussion, which will take, I don't know, yeah, 10, 15 minutes. So Marie France, yeah, Marie France Lutre, director of Pages, who ki kindly attended as well. She has a question. Good, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, well, it's a question to Belle. Um, not directly related to the topic, I'm sorry, but uh, you you show nice corals with, you said, annual growth rings. And I was wondering, how do these rings form? I mean, for tree rings, we know that, I know at least, that they are related to um, the growing season. Um, is it the same for coral? Is there a growing season? I'm sorry, I've, I'm completely ignorant. I know nothing about corals. Thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, yes, it's quite analogous. So um, I'm I'm not sure it's completely well constrained exactly what changes in the ocean chemistry or nutrients that are provided to the corals that... Um, causes it, but yes, there's a, a certain period where they grow faster, a certain period of the year when they grow faster, and a certain period of the year where they grow slower. And that exactly like tree rings, um, it produces that annual banding. Thank you. So 
are there any other questions? If not, I will I will throw I will start throwing my own uh, debates to the public. Okay, one very general question: Where do you see the largest uncertainties in current policy seismology? So, do 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 you need uh, do you want to comment about the need for uh, for better chronologies or data uncertainties? The three of you have highlighted this problem in different aspects relative um, dating or absolute dating or well, one question that uh, I I had when when uh, when I was reading all your contributions is that the, the 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 difficulty sometimes from going to from qualitative to quantitative data or or the spatial resolution here. Do you want to comment on that on the uncertainties or challenges? I I, I think that was very perceptive reading. Uh, Ivan, I think yeah. one of the biggest challenges we have in paleo seismology, it's a forensic discipline. So you actually end up with the best information from combining multiple different approaches to, you mm -hmm. know, addressing the timing and the spatial distribution of rupture on a given fault. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if we had chronologies like Bell was able to show from the corals everywhere from every approach, it would be amazing. Uh, yeah. The reality is we don't. But I think any effort that can be replaced, that can be placed in refining the quality and the precision of age estimates for earthquake event signatures, be they from coastal deformation, corals, tsunami, or turbidites, you know, that is really going to advance the discipline if we're able to actually, you know, relate those different proxies or those different mm -hmm. approaches with much better chronologies. So I, I think that is an area for growth for sure. Yeah. Yeah, along uh, similar lines. I mean, in paleoseismology, for a long time now, we've been able to say, here's the sequence of timing of events at this one site. And then here's another site, and we have a series of events. But the big leap that we're really trying to do now is, can we really tie those together and say, these two events at these two sites were the same or no, they were they were different. And one way to get at that is to get use a really precise temporal method, like the corals are pretty much ideal for that. Uh, but there's, I'm excited to see other approaches, like, for example, the um, synchronicity test with the turbidites is, is another one that can, maybe you don't know the exact timing, but you can say, okay, there was only one event during this period of time over yeah. this area. So there's, um, um, that's really where the the cutting edge now is, I think, is any kind of uh, technique that allows us to tie events together between different sites to answer these questions about uh, what does what do each of these events look like? What does the occurrence, the patterns of recurrence look like over an entire fault system as opposed to a single site? Okay, thank you, both of you. Yes, I have another question. Uh, if someone want to continue with the discussion, Marie France, yes. Yes, just because you to add something about um, the difficulties, I think uh, well, Sidar, sorry if I mispronounce your yeah. name. You mentioned that you cannot have record older than I think five thousand years because yes. before that, the um, well, the, the sea level was lower. So, do you think that you will? You would, you could be able to find other sources in, of information for that region because the, the earthquakes occurred much before that period of time. Is it's probably also a challenge for the yes. region? Yes, yes, you're, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, now we are trying to explore different means to assess the uh, signatures of earthquakes before five thousand years. How do we do? We see seismites on the coastline. Do we see any such similar thing on the shoreline which could actually correlate that? Uh, fortunately, we got this implication that uh, this uh, feeling that we are very confident enough that those records are in the offshore because there was some drilling going on in the offshore where they actually picked up inverted uh, sedimentary layer sequences which could directly be correlated with those earthquake timings at that point of time. And even as uh, our other uh, distinguished speakers uh, pointed out, it is really a problem when we try to correlate spatially of the same sand layer that I'm trying to date along one coastline at a stretch of 200 kilometers. My stations are roughly 50, 60 kilometers apart. 
and when i'm trying to date that using let's say ams uh, c14 or osl or something i have a age error where i fluctuate between 100 to 150 years and the event is 1000 years old so my error ranges are too high in that case so if somehow we could narrow that down if like we have some corals in the offshore but i don't think nobody has worked in my part of the region with this perspective to uh, what uh, bell suggested in 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 her presentation if something of that sort could be integrated with this i think we'll be in a very better position in a very precise position to talk about the events in that case using multiple proxies multiple methods to talk about the same event along the shoreline okay thank you sidar I have another question which links to these uh, well challenges. What what do you think could be the, the the research questions and priorities in paleoseismology in the next ten years? I mean, more dating, dating, dating. That this would be one priority. I I think it's clear to everybody. But I'm thinking about other other research questions. And also, what do you think about about some new technologies, big data science, artificial intelligence? How do you see these these topics in paleoseismology in the next 10 years? Well, I'll throw out that um, I'm I'm very excited to see the turbidite records being tested against known earthquakes. That's something that we um, definitely has to be done, done in order to really get the maximum information out of uh, turbidites. In Cascadia, because there's no historical record, we can argue about it forever um, and, and without actually coming to a resolution. So I'm I'm hoping to see more of that, say, in South America, where there's a very long historical record of subduction earthquakes, or Japan, similarly, um, to really calibrate the turbidite method so we can interpret the Cascadia record um, in a more robust manner. Yeah, and, and I guess related to that, you know, I, I, I would love to see much more integration between paleoseismologists and geophysicists. You know, I think we do, you mentioned Ivan, getting more quantitative in the approaches we take. You know, Bell gave a fabulous example of where they're actually inverting the coastal deformation signature for slip on the fault. That's amazing. You know, we need to be doing similar things in, in turbidite paleoseismology, I guess, where we're understanding you know, the specific ground motion thresholds that are required to generate turbidity currents um, and then inverting, you know, our turbidite data using quantitative ground motion simulations for fault source. Um, and I think, you know, as paleo seismologists or environment people who do environmental reconstructions, we get really passionate about multiple proxies and dating. Uh, and maybe less so about, you know, some of the mo the modeling techniques. So I think there's huge scope there for collaboration between geophysicists and, and um, you know, those of us working in quaternary science. Yeah, and and I, actually, I totally agree because, I mean, we, we, we saw the, the shift in the last few, few years, like before, like uh, based on sedimentary course, we, we were mostly... Uh, debating about, okay, this deposit is mostly like a flood deposit or earthquake, etc. Now we see all the community moving toward this modeling approach. And, uh, and for the future, um, I just saw that uh, one big project like uh, from Jan Klinger uh, will also try to calibrate uh, this uh, instrumental uh, seismicity and also to, to produce the, their own synthetic earthquakes to to control all the parameters and to see how we can understand uh, better uh, all the earthquakes and stuff like that to to calibrate our methods. So yeah, I think it will be the 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 next step to to better understand and to control the earthquakes to then control to 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 better understand the past here. Thank you to all of you for your answers. I have two more short questions. Well, I hope they are short because sometimes I underestimate the, the depth of the of the problem. Uh, I'm going to try to take you out a bit of your comfort zone, paleoseismology, and I want you to think about how would you combine your discipline, paleoseismology, with other fields of paleoscience to solve problems important for society. So try, could you tell me about the, what, what, where do you think the, the most potential of paleoseismology and and to become more interdisciplinary with other with other fields of paleoscience, uh, climate, 
uh, environmental degradation, etc. Do you see some some po po potential synergia between other fields of pathoscience that we are not aware of, <laughs> or you would you would like to to see paleoseismology more involved? I think well. I think one area that could be really exciting at subduction zones is volcano tectonic interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the relationship between, you know, super volcano eruption and mega thrust earthquakes. You know, the, it's something I think that, you know, the two uh, communities working and reconstructing, you know, uh, volcanic activity and earthquake behavior could come together and actually really mm -hmm. start to get apart. There's some um, preliminary work done in that space, but I think those two communities could could definitely make some ground there. Um, yeah, I've got some other ideas, but I want other people to have an opportunity to speak to this too. So I'll be Thank quiet. you, Jamie. I, I think another thing that the paleo seismology could also look into would be what we are facing in our part of the world is mostly the association of earthquakes and landslides, earthquake triggered landslides. But that also leads to a lot of damaging tsunamis in our part of the region. Uh, we basically are preparing models to talk about the early warning system of tsunamis in future when it when they happen. We are when people are doing modeling about that, but it is much more difficult to assess the ground conditions when a landslide is triggered, and those parameters are very very different from what you usually uh, regenerate or study when you talk of the paleo tsunami or uh, tsunami warning system and scenarios. So it would be very interesting to study the integration of earthquakes, triggered landslides, and tsunamis together. Thank you. There's uh, there's definitely a uh, compounded hazard with uh, climate change, sea level rise, um, and earthquake-induced subsidence or liquefaction. Uh, there's definitely going to be more, the impact of liquefaction or coastal subsidence in an earthquake is going to be compounded when the sea level is also rising and um, the water table on land is potentially also rising. So I think that's something in terms of hazards, we have to consider both of those hazards together, not separately, in order to accurately anticipate the um, risk to communities. And there's also, I think, opportunities for um, uh, using data and techniques from one field to help the other field. Corals, for example, were certainly first used in sea level research um climatological climatological resource research and only relatively recently adapted to paleo seismology so i think there's other um opportunities for that kind of um, collaboration and cross-pollination and, Thank and just you. to move beyond the hazard space very quickly because i know that the audience for pages is, is much broader than that you know Earthquakes yeah. generate a range of secondary impacts from landsliding to changes in the sediment dynamics and river systems, and they spill on to impacts on ecosystems and even carbon cycling. And so actually, yes. these are rare events, but they're high magnitude, so they're hard to study those impacts, you know, using instrumental data. But I actually think, you know, bringing paleoecologists together with sedimentologists uh, and even people looking at carbon cycling to actually understand the impact of these events um, on ecosystems and um, carbon cycling more generally uh, is an area that could be really interesting to focus on. Um, and some people are starting to make those interdisciplinary links, but I think it's an area we could focus more on. Yeah, thank you to all of you. I mean, the the goal of this question was to to highlight how how sometimes people have are working on their own uh, niche and they are separated from others. And the goal of, of, uh, of this uh, special issue on paleoseismology was certainly to, to close this gap because sometimes the, the, the rest of the paleo fields are a bit disconnected of all this, uh, what, what you are talking about. Um, in pages, actually, we have good examples of everything which you, you, you have said. We have a working group about uh, volcanic events, bigs uh, and climate. We have a working group about floods and other types of natural hazards. And we have a working group as well about paleo uh, sea level palsy. So certainly there is potential of paleoseismology to interact with these established working groups that vertebrate the community on these other um, tangential fields to paleoseismology. So yeah, you are welcome to uh, to talk to them, or I hope that they, after after the release of this special issue and this webinar, perhaps there is more interaction with uh, in, any of you or anyone in the 
uh, anyone in the field. And I have a very last question. If you can give a short, oh, I always prefer short, but I know that sometimes they are a bit difficult to answer, uh, a short answer. Do you think palaeosismology is accessible to the general public? What is your what is your feeling after you talk to friends, colleagues, family about what you do? How is the what is the perception? Talking something something that uh, happened thousands or hundreds, thousands or millions of years ago, where there was not impact on society landscape visible right now. What is your feeling there? The perception of palaeosismology. In my experience, it's um, highly accessible, actually, especially in comparison to um, many other um, branches of geology or, or even science in general, because it's essentially it's a detective story. We're taking and we can tell we can use the data that we have in a storytelling manner. Um, a beautiful example of this is the 1700 earthquake in Cascadia, which is a prehistoric event but was um, pieced together the exact date and time based on a combination of geology and uh, historical records of the tsunami in Japan. And that's just a wonderful story that's very accessible to people um, in general. So I've, I've had great success in talking to uh, non-specialists, uh, non-scientists and the general public telling paleoseismology stories. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, uh, I, I would okay. second that. I think, um, you know, I, it, it is really accessible because of the, you know, we have to build an argument and a narrative based on things that people can actually observe. And I think the only challenge potentially is the uncertainty. You know, um, lay people really struggle, you know, with the fact that some of these interpretations have a grayness to them. Um, and the minute you, I guess, move into the forecasting space, um, I think that is challenging where you have to, you can't just give them a number, it's a probability or a range. And I think that's where, um, you know, the narrative becomes more complicated. Yeah, I mean, if you stay simple and you don't go too much into the details of each method, like CT scan, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, yeah, most of the people, they understand quite uh, easily. And I mean, if you if you talk about the, the interest for the society, the seismic cycle, et cetera, time it stay kind of logical to understand so i have also uh yeah when, when i when i try to 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 explain it to people it's kind of okay mm -hmm. it, uh, i think it also has to do with the kind of local population or the cluster of people you come across like for example the place where we are working in kutch is one of the most seismically active regions in India, apart from the Himalayas. And it has remained seismically active since historical times, since uh, paleo times, I mean, not many years, thousands of years. And people have got that into their culture, into their lifestyle, and they have learned these things, and they have passed it on. So they know, the common people know very well that how many thousand years ago was there a big earthquake in this region? How many hundreds of years ago was there a big earthquake in the region? Even the places uh, of locations over there are in the local language are based on experiences of earthquakes that they have felt over there. So that's how paleosismology and even earthquakes have been part of people's lives nowadays. I'm very happy to hear this positive reception. Yes, Fernando? It, yeah, if I, it, it's really uh, interesting that uh, Siddharth just um, told, like I, I did my PhD in Turkey and 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 it's also really important and really uh, nice to to be able to explain like to some people that you just mapped and discover a fault in a lake that just crossed their village, for example, and they're really demanding on all the information about that. How does it work? And it's also our mission to 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 teach to 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 learn uh, like to the people how how it works and. And how we work all together to 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 kind of uh, yes let people know how the risk and the hazard is in the in the region. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for all you. I I think I we all could or at least I could stay here for hours because you are all great speakers. You all always have something to 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 bring up to the table, uh, but I'm sorry, I will finish the webinar here. I'm pretty sure some people want to go to sleep now. 
or close to bedtime. Thanks everybody for your great uh, input for, for collaborating in both the special issue and the webinar. This has been a very productive um, exercise come bringing uh, some of the paleoseismology community into the more general uh, paleoscience field. I hope you all enjoyed and thanks again for all your collaboration. And I hope to, 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 to see you at Pages or collaborate with you again in, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Have yes, a nice thank day. You. Thank you, Ivan. Thank, thank, thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, Bye. everyone.